Good morning, everybody. My name is Sam Dawson from Landessa. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Margie McClung, who's going to be moderating today's conversation. Wonderful. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're connecting from. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining us for this exciting discussion about a new partnership between Landessa and Amplio in Liberia. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to note quickly that we are recording this session. Uh, my name is Margie McClung, and I'm the Deputy Chief Program Officer at Landessa. I'm joined today by an excellent panel from our two organizations, and I'd like to start by introducing the panelists. Um, I'm joined by Dr. Emmanuel Ure, who is the Liberia Program Director for Landessa. Emmanuel holds a PhD in Environment and Resource Management from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, in his role as Liberia Program Director, Emmanuel co-hosts the widely broadcasted radio program Land is Life in Liberia, which provides accessible and engaging programming on land rights in Liberia. In addition, we're pleased to have Lindsay Dakin join us. She's a business development coordinator for Amplio. Lindsay holds a, an MA in Sustainable International Development from Brandeis University, and she previously worked for an NGO in Uganda and has served in the Peace Corps in Sichuan Province, China. And finally, we're also joined by Constance Tiege. She's a gender and land tenure specialist based in Landessa's Monrovia office. As a member of the team in Liberia, Constance has really spearheaded the Landessa and Amplio partnership in Liberia, uh, visiting communities to train them on how to use talking books. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today to share thoughts on this exciting new partnership. I'd like to start with some questions for panelists before we open things up to audience questions. Um, and to that point, please share your questions in the Q&A box and we'll set some time aside near the end to address as many as we can. Um, we may not get to all of them and if we're unable to do that, we will follow up um, in the coming days. So Emmanuel, I'd like to start with a question for you. Um, can you share with us why Landessa is working in Liberia and a little bit on the current land rights situation there? Oh, Emmanuel, I think you might be on mute. Right, foolish. <laughs> Welcome to online meeting. Uh, but I started by saying thank you, everyone. We are honored for you to join us uh, for this uh, few in minutes interaction we're going to have here. Thank you very much, uh, Maggie, for the excellent introduction. Um, you know, Lendessa been in Liberia since 2010. You, you know, their rights, uh, like in other countries, are uh, very, very important in Liberia. Uh, the country is smaller in size as compared to where Lendessa works, some of the areas that the organization works, such as in India or in China. The country has a long history of civil war. There was a, a breakdown. Incivility uh, starting from 1989 uh, all the way to 2003. Um, and then small population, the country is poor. After the Civil War, there was this question about what might cause another war. And the answer became very clear that uh, land rights and land issues would serve as a source for another civil war. And so uh, for that reason, we started working as Landessa in Liberia, uh, um, doing research work to support the government in terms of developing land policy and land rights. I will be talking about that in, in a minute. Uh, but since then, in 2018, we've, we opened office in Liberia. And since then, we've been working to help the government of Liberia and the people of Liberia with land rights issues. Thank you. That's excellent, uh, Emmanuel. And I'm wondering if you could just, as a follow on to that, if you could just share a little bit about the current land rights situation and the reform efforts there. Um, yes, so uh, right now, uh, prior to 2018, when Landessa really put work hard to uh, working with other civil society institutions and the government to pass a land rights law, uh, land rights were primarily in the hands of the government. It was all government land or a private land. And for that reason, the government granted large scale concession agreement um, without involvement of local people. 
Um, but the government, working with the government, we did pass a law. The law recognizes and protects the, the rights of indigenous people, rural people. Uh, we are now in the in the stage of implementation. I also want to point that uh, the country is very significant in terms of biodiversity. Liberia currently hosts about 40% of the remaining uh, 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 forests in, in the whole of West Africa. It's called the West African uh, Guinean Forest. The country is a biodiversity hotspot, one of the hotspots, very few hotspots in the world with a lot of uh, critically endangered species. And so um, when you come to conservation and management of the resources for the benefit of the people and the environment, Liberia is very, very strategic. Excellent. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Thank Constance, you. I'd like to, to turn to you and I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about how Landessa is working to ensure communities and individuals benefit from those recent land reforms in Liberia. And, and what are the barriers that you're seeing for Liberians in exercising their land rights? On mute. I forgot. Sorry about that. Um, Landessa has worked for the past three years to ensure that communities are in the know of this law. Um, although this land rights law was passed that actually grants land rights to majority of Liberian citizens, there are competing interests um, when it comes to local elites and other groups. And so it's really important in order for people to be able to sort of benefit from the law to know that it exists. And so for the past three years, uh, through the King Philanthropy Funding, um, Landessa has worked in more than 20 communities to raise awareness about what the law says, um, what rights communities have within the law. Um, Landessa has worked specifically with many women and youth um, in the work that we've done in the past three years. So just educating communities about what the law says, what their rights are. Um, there are many challenges. Uh, the law was passed in 2018. There are many challenges. One of the biggest challenges that um, exist is the information gap. Um, Liberia has a few urban cities and then much of the land, uh, much of the country is very rural. So getting information from sort of like the city to those rural communities is very difficult. Um, that is one barrier, uh, you know, with uh, getting the, the information about the land rights law out. Another barrier is just language. Um, we have about 16 indigenous languages. Um, many of the shows, the radio shows and awareness raising activities on the radio and things like that are done in English. And so it's very difficult for communities who speak one of the 13, I mean, 16 other languages to sort of understand. Um, other ba barriers are uh, very important, I guess, barriers that exist are social norms. Um, unfortunately, we have situations where um, usually women are not uh, the benefactors of land rights. Um, they've been denied access to land. They've been denied use, uh, use of local lands. Usually their, their user rights are sort of restricted. Um, so those are all the barriers that uh, exist currently. Um, and obviously the work that we're doing is sort of to get that information out and to break down those barriers. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to turn now to you, Lindsay. Um, and for those for those who are joining us who may not be familiar with Talking Books, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the technology. So what are Talking Books? Um, and how has Amplio used them to address global development challenges? Yeah, thanks so much, Margie. And yeah, thanks to Landessa for hosting us today. We're so thrilled to be able to share um, this great project with with the world. Um, so right, um, Amplio was really founded to um, bridge that information gap that Constance just referenced um, with especially the world's hardest to reach communities. Um, so many people are being left behind, left out of that knowledge economy that so many of us are so used to participating in. Um, but there is a huge, um, 
digital divide. Of course, you know, access to knowledge is, is so much based on technology these days. And so there's a huge digital divide in the world that we see. And so Amplio was really trying to create a, a digital solution that would that would address some of that. Um, I'll just throw a couple stats at you that I pulled. Um, it's currently about 30% of people around the world that um, don't have access that don't even have mobile phones. And then about 40% of people around the world that don't have internet access still. And I'll just note also that, um, also as Constance mentioned a little bit, there's a, a gender element to that as well. There's an even bigger um, gender digital divide in that um, across at least the least developed countries in the world, there's about a 40% gap um, in internet access between men and women and also about a 10% gap in mobile phone ownership. And so, right, those are the challenges that we're facing um, globally. Uh, Constance and Emmanuel can talk more, you know, specific to Liberia, but um, that's really the place where Amplio was coming from, trying to, right, figure out how to bridge those gaps. And so the talking book is an inclusive digital technology for sharing information with all of those folks that are being left behind. Um, it's an easy to use audio device that can deliver hours of on-demand audio content in local languages, um, mainly around social and behavior change messaging. Um, and I'm gonna do a demonstration of the device in just a second. Um, I, we thought it might be helpful for you to, to see it in action. Um, but yeah, it was also really developed um, with those with zero or very low literacy skills in mind. So you'll notice that um, you don't need to know any numbers, letters, words to be able to navigate. Um, it was designed with this simple iconography um, for folks to pretty easily be able to, to grasp and navigate. Um, and I'll also just note another feature that sets it apart from other communications channels is that um, it's got integrative um, data collection capabilities, both quantitative and qualitative data. So it will track the usage statistics um, the, the number of times a message has been listened to or the total amount of time that, that the talking book has been engaged with. Um, it will store all of that for your access to be able to do some analysis around, you know, which messages are, are being most successful, are most popular, are most effective, um, and, and just monitoring the, the engagement levels in your different communities. Um, and then on the qualitative side, it also has the ability to record user feedback messages. And so um, as somebody is li listening to a message, if they have a question or a comment or, you know, they want to they want to raise something directly to the to the program staff, the folks they know that are running their program, they can record that message directly onto the device. And then you can, you know, as a program manager, bring that back to your different stakeholders um, or integrate that into your reporting. So that's definitely one of my favorite features of the device as well. So I'm going to I'm going to turn it on for a moment so you can kind of see it in action. Um, hopefully you can hear well. Welcome to the Amplio Talking Book. Press the right hand to choose a subject. Talking Book Programs. To learn about Talking Book Programs, press the tree. To try another subject, press the right hand. Partner Testimonials. To hear Partner Testimonials, press the tree. To try another... So that's just the, the navigation, the audio navigation. You can hear that it's kind of um, bringing you um, through different categories that the audio content is, is organized into playlists onto the device. And so right now it's kind of bringing you through the different topics that you can listen to and choose to choose those messages. Um, and then the messages themselves, I'll play a sample message in a second. Um, but the messages themselves might take the form of a song or a drama or an interview or an endorsement message from an influencer, um, things like that. So, so I have a couple sample messages, unfortunately not from this Liberia project, but um, I'll play a couple sample messages for you. Other subject, press sample messages. To hear messages our partners have used in the field, press the tree. A UNICEF Rwanda children's song for Mahama refugee camp. That's one of the songs. A drama about newborn health for USAID's Afia Tamiza project. <laughs> Mama na 
So there's a lot that you can do, you know, for our communications professionals out there. Of course, you know, there's a lot you can do with this audio format and um, it's really great to see, yeah, the different ways that people get creative with it. Um, the one other thing I'll note that kind of speaks to what Constance mentioned is that um, all of those navigation prompts, the entire talking book can be configured to, to operate in any local language in any context around the world. And so all of those prompts that you heard, you know, to listen to this message, press the tree, that can be recorded in the local language and that's something that's so powerful for well for both programs it, it, it helps them to kind of bridge those barriers as Constance mentioned but it's also powerful for users to hear content that's that's in their native language that's in that local language and not you know in a national language like English or French or something and so um, yeah I think that's um, that's what I can introduce about the talking book again happy to field some questions later on but um, yeah hopefully that gives you a picture of what we're talking about. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for that overview of talking books and the and the demo of the device itself. I think that's helpful to understand what it is we're talking about. Um, I understand that Amplio has been using talking books with a number of development partners on a, a number of topics, but probably most um, often used in the health sector, global health sector, and, and perhaps a little bit in, in agricultural extension and some nutrition uh, issues. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it was like for Amplio to begin working on a new subject like land. Uh, did this change how Amplio approached the partnership or any elements of how you typically work? Yeah, thanks. Um, so you're right, a lot of our past projects have been um, in mainly the health or agriculture sectors. Um, just a couple examples, we did a big UNICEF project in Ghana that focused around on um, wash, water and sanitation, and also um, health, malaria prevention and things like that, um, as well as a maternal health project that we did, um, USAID project funded project in Kenya. Um, and another example was a, um, project that we ran with Mita, also in Ghana, working with um, women soybean farmers um, to improve their yields and household nutrition, a number of different um, outcomes targeted on that project. Um, and then, yeah, I guess I'll mention too, a, a current um, sectional reproductive health project that we're doing with DSO in Zambia, targeting adolescents and youth this year. So that's just a sample of some of the projects, past projects that we've done. Um, and we've definitely loved, you know, partnering with Landessa this year and, um, you know, entering into this new kind of legal rights and land empowerment sector. Um, and of course, it's, it's just lovely to work with Landessa as, um, you know, a local Seattle partner. <laughs> I know that at least in the before times, before COVID, we'd maybe stop and get coffee together when we were in office downtown. Um, so yeah, it's been great to get the Landessa partnership off the ground. It's been, um, I think a couple years in the making and that's super exciting. Um, but one of the things that I love about my job and about Amplio's work that I think is so interesting is that the talking book is such a flexible platform. And so it is really easy for, for us to kind of um, adapt to these different sector areas and these different types of partnerships that we're um, that we're looking at. Um, yeah, what I love is you know talking to the different partners about what their needs are, what their program models are, what kind of information they're trying to get out there into the world, and um, and you know figuring out how talking books can integrate into that. Um, and so, um, for example, I know. We have many different program models that we've worked with in the past. Um, and so for Landessa, um, I know that we're doing more of a household rotation model because we really wanted to be able to blanket communities with, with this information and reach a lot of different kind of target demographics, men and women and youth and older folks. Um, and so we thought that the household rotation, the household model would be the best where we're bringing the talking books directly into households um, via community animators. And I think Emmanuel and, Kim, and Constance can talk much more about that, but um, that really, you know, allows, yeah, a lot of different folks to engage at the household. Households can listen together and discuss together um, at that level. But there are other program models that we've worked with as well. Um, talking books um, work really well 
being integrated into more of a group model. So if there are existing, you know, BSLAs, savings groups, or agriculture groups, um, we've introduced talking books that way. So the groups can listen together and discuss during their meetings, um, but then still group members can maybe take the talking books home and listen at home with their other family members, um, you know, between meetings and discuss that way. So that's been a really successful model on some of our projects. Um, and then maybe for more of those health kind of projects, we've also seen um, <clears throat> talking books, <clears throat> excuse me, go into the hands of community agents or extension workers. So for example, maybe a community health volunteer will have the talking book to support some of their community outreach activities, um, you know, different sensitization sessions. They can just call up some of the messages um, that, have, that have been stored on the talking book. They have kind of that library of content at their fingertips. So, so again, it's a, it's a flexible platform. It's a really kind of flexible model that we can work with um, programs and partners to figure out, you know, how best to integrate it into, into their needs and their goals. Wonderful. Lots of, lots of flexibility in, in approach and use of the tool. Um, Constance, I'd like to turn back to you for a second and, and ask if you can share your perspective on how talking books have been received in, in communities. So what kind of reaction have you seen in the communities that, that are receiving these talking books for the first time? Oh, I think you may be muted, Constance. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so far, Vendessa has deployed about 850 talking books um, in, in three different counties. Liberia has 15 counties, so we're in about three of the um, 15 counties, which means that the talking book um, languages have been translated to three of our local languages. Um, one of the biggest challenges, as I spoke about earlier, um, of getting talking books, um, one of the biggest challenges of getting information into communities is the language barrier. Um, and then just the fact that people don't read or, read or write. You know, many times pamphlets and flyers and things like that are taken into communities. The majority of the community members are not literate in rural communities, and so it's difficult for them to be able to sort of like benefit from a pamphlet or something that has to do with reading and writing. Um, I was actually really taken aback by how excited the community members uh, were um, when the talking book were, was taken into the community. So um, the first community that I went into was, was Riverses. And I talked, you know, as I was talking, I could see that the community members were a little bit apprehensive. And the first question they had was, is this language, is this in my local language? And I said, you know, wait and let's see. And when I put on the talking book and it came on and it was speaking Basa, which is the language that's spoken in River says, I mean, people were so excited. They couldn't believe it, that this thing was reading information back to them and it was in a language that they could understand. Um, I actually, as I was going to River says I got stuck for a little while and there was a town that was there that I decided to just test the talking book um, out. And I gave one of the talking books to a couple of people and I told them how to use it. And as soon as it came on, they were like, this is great, Basa, we can understand. Um, but it was well received. Another thing that I remember that was just really exciting to see, there was a lady who was probably like 92 or 93 years old. Um, she, when she came into the, the gathering, people were like, oh, you're too old. You're not going to be able to get this. You're not going to be able to understand how to use this. Um, but uh, I, she sat through the meeting. I showed her how to use a talking book. And this lady who is in her 90s was able to use um, the talking book. Um, so it's easy to use. Um, it's in the local languages. You don't need to know how to read or write in order to benefit from it. Um, and it's, it's, it's a radio. It's sort of like a radio, right? So you can put it down as a device where more than three or four people can listen to it. Um, so I remember one of the communities that I did the training in, as I was leaving the community, um, I saw about uh, maybe 10 or 12 people around this talking book and I had to stop and jump out of the, the car um, because you can see young people. There's a photo. You can see young people. You can see old people, um, older people. I mean, it was just really incredible to see that, you know, 
anybody can benefit from it, whether or not you know how to read or write, whether you're young, whether you're old, a lot of people can benefit from it. So um, the communities were just excited to know that there's this thing that is speaking back to them in their own language. They're able to understand the information um, and it's very easy to use. So um, I was excited to see the reaction of the communities. Um, so I can definitely say that it was well, well received. In um, the particular community where uh, I tested out the talking book, which was not one of our benefactory community, they, they actually requested the talking book um, in their community. So um, I'm looking forward to scaling it up and, and helping other communities to, you know, benefit from the talking book. Yeah. Oh, that's super exciting. Thank you, Constance, for sharing your experience with the rollout. Um, so this question is is for all of the panelists, and it's the last of the prepared questions. I am seeing some some good Q and A, uh, some good questions coming in through the Q and A function. So we'll turn soon to audience questions. But I wanted to wrap up with a question um, about where we see opportunities for increased distribution of this technology and the content that Landessa is developing. Kind of what's next for this partnership. Um, so I'd love to get perspectives both from Landessa and from Amplio on this question, and maybe we'll start with Emmanuel. Uh, thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, personally, I am very excited about talking books. Um, you know, those are really raw computer devices. You see they are very durable. Uh, they, 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 were, they are made really to withstand tension in those communities. And so they are very good. Um, the thing I also love about it is that it can be used as a master trainer. Well, if countries like Liberia, there's no developed role, getting to rural communities during the rainy season is very, very difficult, even during the dry season. And, and so it's so much expensive to get somebody like me to go there all the time to train people. It's very, very expensive. But I can be able to develop a message, uh, either in simple Liberian English or in the parallel language that I speak, and then be able to upload it on a talking box. And then, um, uh, people like Constant, other people can take it into the community, conduct a little bit of training. And the talking book can then serve as a master trainer, uh, like a TOT form, uh, to be able to convey real good information to people. And they have the ability to also ask their own question. That question can come back to me. I can answer the question and send it back. So it's very, very important that way. And so we're going to continue using talking book this way as a master trainer in Liberia but rolling talking books into a lot of communities, our partner institution, the government institution we work with is the Liberian Learning Authority. The Liberian Learning Authority is super excited about talking books. In fact, this particular, I mean, next week, the, the authorities, uh, the leadership from that institution will be visiting the communities to see the people interacting with talking books. That's how excited they are. And they, they are about to go see talking books uh, deploy in the field and people interacting with it. So uh, we're going to move to a lot more counties. So we're going to uh, use it into different direction. But also uh, within Landesa, country like Myanmar and other countries and within uh, around the world, they are also very interested in talking books. So what we're doing in Liberia, they have talked to us and said that we're looking forward to what you tell us, because we might um, adapt this technology in other geographies as well. So the relationship with, with Ampere we see is progressing and progressing really well. Thank you. Wonderful. And and maybe Lindsay, I'll ask you to add on any thoughts there. Sure. I mean, we've been so thrilled to see, um, yeah, the reception of the talking books in Liberia and right how pleased um, Emmanuel and Constance have been as program managers with with the experience of rolling out the, the project. Um, so yeah, you know, we're ready to, to move along with Landessa with every scale up that you um, see fit. I know we've also talked been in conversation with maybe a couple other Landessa country offices, you know, to see if we might bring it to, to other parts of the world as well. So we'll see how that develops. Um, but yeah, we're just thrilled that um, that the reception has been so great there. And um, yeah, we're ready to, to scale up as, as you see fit. Excellent. Thank you so much. I, I'm really excited to see the Q&A box populating with lots of great questions. So I think I'd like to transition to um, audience questions now. And um, I'll start with a question about who creates the content 
for the Landessa Amplio campaign. And I think this may be interesting um, for, for Constance uh, or Emmanuel to address, but it would also be great to hear from Lindsay about um, other models that, that you've observed for content creation among other partners. I, I, as for the content we have in Liberia, we created the, con the content constant and I primarily, but, but we're hosts of civil society because what happened is that the law was passed in 2018, high level language. It was broken down by lawyers. It was broken down further and it was verified by the Liberian Land Authority that the messages that we develop, they align with the intent of the law. So then we took that and broke that further into Liberian English. Um, then local dialect speakers through our partner institution, Development Education Network in Liberia, it's a Liberian owned NGO. Uh, using that institution as a, as a partner institution, they have a recording studio. Then they're able to recruit dialect speakers to be able to read um, the dialect in studio where the contents uh, were created. Uh, that way and then upload it on a talking book. So basically, uh, it's a whole set of processes we go through to make sure that the contents are well developed and they are well acceptable. Thank you. Great. And Lindsay, could you talk about how other partners have tackled the, the process of creating content? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Amplio, I'll say, um, isn't currently at least <laughs> in the business of you know developing content for the talking books that has mainly been um, in the hands of our partners to to do and to manage because we recognize that it's so important for especially these um, social and behavior change messages to be really locally contextual right so so we can't we're not really in the best position you know sitting here in Seattle to develop messaging that's going to be effective in these communities in you know rural Liberia or Ghana or Kenya or where have, where, wherever you are. And so, um, you know, we provide advice to our partners about how best to go about, you know, the content development. Um, we also have a couple um, affiliate organizations currently in um, Ghana and Kenya and Ethiopia that are experts in content development and do have a lot of experience specifically with talking book programs as well. And so when it's appropriate, when, when the context is right, we can connect partners to, um, to those local affiliates who can support on the content development. And we do have goals of, I think, developing more of that network of local consultants who can really support on the content development for, for talking books. But as it stands right now, it's kind of a mixture of, you know, some of our local partners that we have established um, and, and then also the, the program, the talking book partner itself, um, kind of taking, taking charge of that. And so sometimes too, I think um, Landessa did this and then other partners will, they'll bring in an external content consultant, um, you know, somebody who's an expert in that kind of communications development, communication strategy to, um, to help with, with, that, with that development. Wonderful, good. Well, I'm seeing a number of questions pop up in the, the chat box, kind of um, centering around issues of how do we receive feedback from users uh, uh, who are, are um, hearing the content on the talking books, and then how do we measure impact, particularly if we're looking for um, social or behavior changes. Um, using the talking books technology. Um, and so for, for these questions, maybe I'll start with you, Lindsay, but then I'd love to talk, um, maybe hand it over to Emmanuel or Constance to, to talk about, I mean, this is uh, a very early stage rollout for Landessa, so um, I think we'll, we'll have them talk a little bit about how they anticipate um, using some of the features to measure impact and, and look at behavior change. Sure, yeah, I can start and just kind of, again, talk more generally. Um, right, so in terms of the feedback, again, one of the, one of the features that I love that I think is most powerful on the talking book is that ability to record, you know, in people's own words, you know, directly their voice, directly onto the talking book, you know, what is their experience, um, what kind of questions do they have, and so that's, um, of course, can offer such a rich amount of um, qualitative data for, for a program um, to work with. The caveat on that is that, you know, that can be 
a mountain, an avalanche of data that you have at your fingertips, you know, if you have a few hundred talking books out in the field and, and folks leaving messages on all of them, you know, that, that is quite a lot of qualitative data to, to receive and to process. And so, you know, we do advise our partners to um, think hard about how they want to be able to put that feedback to use and um, what kind of system, what kind of capacity can they put in place to, to be ready to process some of that. Um, what we've seen on larger scale projects is that they will maybe do kind of a more of a random sampling of messages so that they can get a taste of, you know, what folks from across different communities are saying without maybe having to process each and every one of those messages, which again can be a lot capacity wise. But we did see on one of our UNICEF projects that they really wanted to invest a lot into putting that user feedback to use. And so I think essentially hired kind of a whole team of people that, that were just gonna be devoted to that. So of course it's UNICEF and those resources, but um, yeah, the, the sky's the limit in terms of, you know, how you can put that, that feedback to use, which again, can be so, so rich for folks. So I think maybe Constance and Emmanuel can talk a little bit more if you want to about um, how you're planning to, to put the feedback to use in your project. I'll just say quickly too, in terms of of impact. Um, right, you're right that this is kind of earlier on in this project, so we don't yet have the impact data on, um, on how it's affecting folks' um, knowledge and attitudes about their land rights. But typically what we've done in the past is implement um, CAP surveys, knowledge, attitude, and practices surveys to understand, right, what kinds of changes in behavior are we seeing as a result of these messages that have, that have gone out. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I, I might turn it over to constant uh, or sorry, excuse me to Emmanuel first. Uh, Emmanuel, I think it, it may be helpful for folks to kind of understand how the talking books element kind of um, complements or uh, helps us in the time of COVID with some of our existing programmatic efforts in the communities where we work. So, um, you know, so there's a little bit of a better sense of how this folds into broader efforts that we've been making at the community level, and then how we're planning on kind of measuring the impact of those broader efforts, but also the, the uh, talking books technology specifically. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Maggie. Um, the the traditional method of conveying information, land right information to the community, we did that through our partner organization FCI and Denel. Uh, they carry on community theaters. They carry on training where they brought 50, 100 people together to train them who are peer of D or two. Those were the methodologies they were using. Then came COVID-19. With COVID-19, the restriction that you cannot gather a large group of people together. So talking books began an innovation. That's the reason why we adapted the household level of uh, information sharing using talking books, because we know households will stay together. And there's no way that you can stay a man and a woman, you know, they're gonna isolate except where one person is sick. So we decided to use talking books to stay care on the messages that we've been carrying on, additional information we've been carrying on, but with small group of people at the household level, wherein you know the woman and the husband will listen, the kids will listen, and but also we invest something in there so that the woman can have some time if she wants to use it by herself. She can be able to take it and listen to it by herself. All the men want to do that as well. So that's basically what the methodology we use in terms of as a COVID-19 strategy. And I think it's very good. We're gonna continue that at some point. When it comes to measuring data, yes, we are still in the early, um, the early stages of it, but what talking book is capable of collecting geographic information, the particular area where it's used, the type of content that is, uh, that is used most, the kind of questions that people are recording more. So the talking book has the capability to collect all the data. So what we, we supplemented that by giving a baseline survey. So when we give talking book to people or a group of people for the first time, we give them a baseline survey on the content of the talking books, the content I, um, women land rights, youth land rights, alternative dispute resolution, how, how, where, where to find help in case you need it, that kind of information. So we develop a, a baseline based on, on the content. So as we call it talking book, we'll also be able to administer in line and we'll be able to uh, measure the change in knowledge from the baseline to the end line. 
um, to the inland or collect the talking book. So that's how we'll get to know the kind of way the, the knowledge has changed in a community based on uh, talking books. Um, but uh, I would like Constance to chime in if she has some additional point. Constance? No, I think you said everything I know. Okay, great. Well, there are, uh, thank you for that, for explaining that. I think that's really helpful. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions that are a little more focused on land rights. So um, there's a question here for Constance and Emmanuel. When you work to allow rural women to know about and then exercise their land rights, do you find that there is generally community support for this? Um, how does that show up? How do you, how do you observe support for um, women's land rights. And in cases where there may not be support, um, are there, is there a sense that women may be in danger of emotional or, or even physical abuse if they try to exercise their land rights in that context? Um, so how are we trying to work on mitigating that um, when it does show up in communities? And maybe uh, I'll start with I you. Let Constant, yeah, Constant can take on this. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the challenges with behavioral change is that there will always be some sort of pushback. Um, as I stated previously, for a very long time, there is this sort of um, thought or practice, I should say, that um, women are not landowners. Women are not controllers of, of their customary land. Previously, before the Land Rights Act was passed, um, women's land rights was always tied to a male in the community. And so the work that Landessa is doing now is to sort of change that behavior and um, by educating communities about what the law says. Um, in some communities, they are pushed back, um, but I think we've consistently seen that with time, um, community members are starting to accept that women are, are you know, legal owners of land. Um, behavioral change is something that is going to take time. It's not something that is always automatic. Um, but I think based on the sort of work, like Lindessa has been in one community for the past three years, it takes time, right? I think this is part of the reason why this work is really expensive. Um, it, takes, it takes time to sort of change that behavior but definitely in many of the communities that we are working in, we see that in time, the, 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 the attitude uh, starts to change and a lot of men start to accept, and even women, sometimes even the women themselves feel as if like they are not owners of land because it's what they've known customarily in practice. Um, and so I think in those instances, we are seeing that behavior change is happening and um, I think one of the reasons why is, I guess, the way that Lindessa works. So part of what the partners are doing are training people that are known as no champions. Those are men who believe in women's rights. Uh, they are helping along with um, our partner institutions to champion women land rights. Um, but then also working with local leaders. You cannot do this work and leave out the clan chief, the paramount chief, the local leaders. Um, the local leaders are sort of like the holders of like customary norms and practices. And so if you do wanna change those behavior, you need to get them on board. Um, so this work involves educating not only women and youth about their rights, but also local leaders to get their buy-in um, into, into uh, what the law says. Wonderful, Constant. I just want to add to it that uh, we follow the principle of uh, do no harm. Uh, so it's at the core of the work we do. Land right messages and women land right is sensitive. So at first, uh, we will go with the economic benefit of women land right. We're not going, going and throw a law at the people and say, this is the law, you have to do it. That's not, a, that's not the methodology. So we emphasize more on the economic benefit of the woman owning land right to the community, to the family. Um, and gradually, uh, men have their concern, and then we have to address some of the concern. And at the end, we bring the law and say, in fact, this is really what the law says is going forward. The Constitution, this is what it says. And our partner institutions are very good at this. So we have seen testimonies of little things like men who never used to have their wives take care of children. We see men come forward and say, you know why? 
because of this training, I can now help my wife to even cook, to even wash dishes and do other things in the home. So we see a lot of positive outcome from the work we're doing through our partner institution. And the, the, the talking books are there to complement. Somebody also asked what we complement talking book with other form of teaching. The answer is yes. Uh, as time goes by, we don't just throw in talking book and just leave there. Um, people will go and as time go by, whole big community gathering. Hopefully, we can get COVID-19 out of the way and be able to answer some specific questions in addition to questions that people will ask on talking book. And you know, if we find that, uh, if we're analyzing the content of of questions from talking book, uh, some 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 question are thematic area that cut across many area. You need to go in the community and then be able to emphasize some of the point and answer some of the questions. So. Again, there might be a challenge or pushback, but the methodology is really the do no harm theory, and we try as much as possible to stick to that. So many, if, they, if the area is absolutely sensitive, that this discussion will pull women in harm, harm's way, we have to find other ways to do it. We'll not just go and start doing it and ignore that, that aspect of it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so there are a couple of questions that have come through in the Q&A chat that really get at the question of, you know, in, in maybe in a little bit more specific detail, what kind of land rights information are we providing to communities in these talking books? And what do we expect the benefit for people will be of receiving this information? So kind of what's the long term vision and the change that we expect to see um, by sharing land rights information with talking books. So I, I think uh, um, the information we're sharing is based on the land rights law passed in 2018. The land rights law adapt custom and traditional practices with, with a limit that you practice the custom and traditional practices in, in conformity with the constitution. The Constitution does recognize and protect the rights of every Liberian, including women and young people. So as you manage your customary uh, land with your practices, you got to do it now in conformity with the Constitution. And these are the things you need to do to be in conformity with the Constitution. So that's basically the core of the message we're trying to deliver to these people. There's a specific session on women land rights. When we talk about women land rights, what are we talking about? Land rights in general, what is land right? What is the benefit of individuals gaining land rights within the community? What are the benefits specifically for women to own land rights, just like men have greater land use rights, uh, to be able to allow women to do that? What are the benefits? Uh, so those are some of the youth land rights. What is youth land right? Who are youth in the community? Then we also talk about alternative dispute resolution. What is it? What is it uh, to settle your land dispute outside of court? Who are responsible? Where to get information if you wanted to uh, seek help for alternative dispute resolution? And then the Liberia Land Authority, the government institution responsible to roll out the land rights law. What is the institution? What are their function at the county level and at the national government level? If people need help for land rights, if people want to solve their land, they want to do different things with land, where to get the information? So basically, those are broadly, those are some of the information uh, we share on talking books in the local languages. Yeah, Wonderful. Just, uh, oh, sorry. Um, also, ahead. one of the most important messages that's on there is how communities can actually formalize their customary land. So as we stated that this New Land Rights Act was passed in 2018, and it, it sets different, um, I guess, uh, 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 guidelines and regulations for how communities can actually get a deed for their land um, that's very different from private land. Um, and so those messages are on there, educating communities about step one to the last uh, last step on how communities can actually formalize their customary land. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both for kind of explaining that, that you know, what I heard from you both is that this is really about giving communities all of the information that they need about dramatic changes that happen to land tenure in Liberia and uh, the implications for communities of those changes, um, you know, both for communities being able to protect their 
their land and, and get a, a deed in, in a way that was not available to them before, but also in a socially inclusive and gender equitable manner so that governance is really benefiting individuals um, in addition to the community writ large, um, which is really exciting. So thank you for explaining that. We have a few more minutes and a couple of other questions coming through. Um, and this one, I, I'd, uh, I'd love to talk um, both with Constance and then uh, maybe have, have Lindsay come in and share a little bit on the technical end of this question. But can you talk a little bit about how many languages are loaded onto the talking books um, that we're using in Liberia. And then um, there's a second question that, second part to this question that I think would go to Lindsay, which is how do people select a language? Constance, can I start with you? Yes, so there are three different languages that's loaded to the talking books. Um, there is Basa, there is Loma, there is Liberian English, and there's Pellet. Actually, there's four, sorry. So there are four different languages, but we're currently only using three of the different languages um, in three of the counties. Um, in terms of selecting the languages, um, we do it on our end. So based on the community that I'm deploying the talking books in, there is a software called the TB Loader. I'm, I'm answering Lindsay's part. I'm sorry. <laughs> but there are three languages, and Lindsay can answer the rest of them. Thanks, Constance. Lindsay, can you tackle the question on the language selection? No, Constance, you're a pro now. I was ready for you to just start to explain it all. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, yeah, so, right. There is, OK, I'll, I'll get a little technical here. There is an option for the talking book to be loaded, one talking book to have two libraries of content in two different languages, right? So, so we can configure the talking book so that there are two languages simultaneously on the talking book um, so that somebody could choose or kind of toggle back and forth between one library or the other. But what happens more commonly and what we've done in, in Liberia with Landessa is that um, as we're setting up the project, we will get from, from the program managers kind of the list of recipients and, and what communities you're, you're working in and, and where they are and what languages are spoken in each community. And so then as we're um, loading the content onto the talking book, we're going to say, okay, this talking book is going into this community and the system, the software will know that, okay, this community speaks this language. So we're going to put this language content onto this talking book and that's going to go out there. So, so we'll set it up so that we know which languages are spoken where and which talking books are going to be designated to the different communities and then just load that appropriate language onto each of those talking books. I hope that made sense. Constance, maybe you could have explained it even better than me. <laughs> No, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. That's exactly. It. Yeah, super helpful. Thanks for adding in that technical piece. Um, I, I think we may have one time for one last question and then we'll need to wrap up. Um, there's a question about how has land formalization so far um, impacted biodiversity in areas in Liberia? And, and I, I know that we're kind of in early days for land formalization. Uh, a lot of time has been spent up to this point on awareness raising, but there are some pilots that are running in Liberia that are working on formalization. And I'm wondering, um, Emmanuel, if you have any information thus far about biodiversity outcomes related to those pilots that are being run. I think what I can say right now, it, the law was passed in 2008. Regulations have been developed. We still care on that awareness. It's still very early for us to tie any causation to that law and say because of the law, this happened. Um, it's still early, especially in the case of conservation and biodiversity preservation thing. But what I can say for sure is that uh, clarity around resource ownership is very important in terms of any other way you want that resource to be used. Uh, to say that this person hires this with a clear mandate, because if you want, want to manage that, especially land-based resources, you want to manage it, then you need to identify who owns what. And that will give you a clear pathway as to who to be speaking to. Prior to the passage of the land right law, there was no clarities were not provided, which served as a big 
hindrance. I talk about the way that other government or other powerful individuals we give a lot of concession to people in knowing the people right who occupy the land. So going forward, we could say that if Liberia is establishing a Rare Plus program wherein people are paying for eco, uh, ecosystem services or somebody paying to keep the forest, you can now identify the owners of the forest and their life can be imparted. Uh, if at all you're trying to conserve that forest, you're trying to create an easement or whatsoever you call it, um, the real owner can be identified and some of the resources can go to them in terms of school, clinic, and the rest of it. That's very, very important. So that's what the law is doing, to be able to provide clarity around land ownership, which is the basis for our own world preservation of the resources. Wonderful, Emmanuel. And I would just add a, a one other point, which is that, you know, um, perhaps not in the context of Liberia yet, but uh, in other areas around the world, I think there is fairly good evidence that um, community natural resource governance has pretty good conservation and, and biodiversity outcomes when compared with government management of those same types of resources. So we're hoping that those similar outcomes might manifest themselves in Liberia as this um, this rolls out. Well, I think we have reached pretty close to the end of our time. This was a really rich discussion and thank you so much to the panelists for a lively and engaging conversation. Thank you for every, thanks to everyone for attending and for seeding such wonderful questions in the Q&A box. Um, we hope that this was a really interesting discussion for all of you. I certainly felt that it was, um, but just a reminder that the webinar has been recorded um, and we will share out uh, a link for the recording to everyone who has attended. Um, if you ended up asking a question either in the chat box or the Q&A box that was not answered by the team, um, we will be doing some follow-up with you in the coming week uh, to try and get responses to you on those questions. Thank you again, everyone. I really appreciate it and have a wonderful day.